I'm honored to be up here and uh, present this, but it's representative of so many amazing people in our team. Uh, some of the men you've seen in that video, some amazing women that got behind, and it's of you. I mean, so many people in this church uh, either financially supported us being able to do this or prayed for us, which was, trust me, we needed your prayers while we were out there, and we felt them, and uh, so we're just so thankful for this church for doing that. Before we get started, I just want to pray. Lord, uh, I just uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be up here and share some of the things that you have done uh, for the people in Afghanistan. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, that Pastor Jeff would, would share his pulpit with me. And thank you, for, and I, I pray for him today where he's out uh, speaking. Lord, I pray for him and, and Miss Gail uh, that God will give uh, Pastor Jeff the words to uh, speak today. And Lord, as a, in honor of Pastor Jeff, as he always does, to pray for other churches in our community. Lord, specifically today, we pray for North Central Church, Pastor Larry Emerson, uh, one of our neighbors here, pray for their church uh, and them today. Lord, and I thank you for Veterans Day, Lord, that we could be in this country, Lord, that despite all the negative things going on in our country, this is still the greatest country in, in, on the planet, Lord. And since 1775, you've raised men up in this country and women up to serve in our military to, who have fought, died, and bled uh, for our freedoms, Lord, the freedoms that you gave us and, and that, that were given to us by you, Lord. And I, and I thank you for that. Uh, for us being born in America and us being able to live here, uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, well, with, with Veterans Day, can uh, I have all the veterans stand up? <laughs> so. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of people ask, like, you know, how do you think a veteran on Veterans Day? And, and one of the things I think the best way to, to thank a veteran on Veterans Day is what we're doing today. We're living out the freedoms that they have fought for. Uh, every veteran, again, since 1775 that has raised their hand and made an oath to defend this country uh, have protected those freedoms that God gave us here. And one of those freedoms is to be able to freely worship. Many people don't know, but we're part of only 25% of the world's population that get to do this on a Sunday. They get to freely worship. The rest of the world lives in persecution of that. And so for that, I, I'm, I'm certainly thankful. And uh, happy Veterans Day to all of you. Uh, if you've seen in that end of that video uh, of Save Our Allies, right, Mighty Oaks, and uh, the Independence Fund started this Save Our Allies effort, ended up being its own nonprofit. The work we did there was we, uh, the task force we called it was Task Force 6-8, which comes from Isaiah 6-8, uh, one of my favorite verses of the Bible. It says, and then I heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said... Here am I, send me. I think everyone involved in that task force felt that burden on their heart by God to say, go help these people. And we said, you know, send me, that we'll go. And uh, I think it, most people in, at some point in their life will feel that burden or stirring from God to go do something profound for God to help other people. But when we stop and think about it, think it through, oftentimes we feel very inadequate or un unqualified to do those things, right? Maybe it's because of our our insecurities, right, our past failures, our experiences, our lack of experiences, our own fears. Has anybody ever felt that? Me too, right? So uh, especially in the last few months. The, th the thing uh, that we recently accomplished in Afghanistan at Save Our Allies, uh, it, was, it was incredible. I mean, the people involved, it was absolutely incredible, and it's something that we're very proud of. But the truth is, it was divine in nature. We, have, we had no ability to pull off what we did. And, and I can't even explain to you how some of the things, looking back, were just miraculously orchestrated. The way they, they rolled out to happen the way they did to save all those people, it was nothing that I could point to other than God orchestrating those things. The title of this message that today is The Warrior Within, which is, to me, the warrior within us is the Spirit of God in us, who stirs us, who, who calls us, who burdens our hearts, and gives us the courage, and, and more, most importantly, equips us to fight the battles of this world on His behalf. And uh, so today, as I talk about the things of Afghanistan, I'm not talking about me or my, our team's achievements. What I really want to point out is our weaknesses, right, our inadequacies, and why someone like me should have never been a part of such amazing things. But God used us in spite of that, right? In the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 11.30, it says, if I, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness, right? Why is that? Because if we're able to do things on our own, well, we get the credit for those things. But the things that God, the things that, uh, God 
or, or not to be done our own. The things of God are not meant to be done our own, right? And if we talk about our weakness in those things, when we do them, then God gets the credit for that, and that's where it belongs. Uh, so why would I feel inadequate about doing something like we just did in Afghanistan? I mean, I have a tremendous amount of experience. I've trained since I was 13 years old to be in the military. I uh, went in the Marine Corps when I was 17 years old. I went to, made it in a recon right away. Before I went to Afghanistan the first time, I had 10 years of every school you can imagine. I uh, went through all the training and, you know, from, you know, military freefall parachutist to combat diver to, you know, all these, uh, uh, all these like, real high-tech uh, schools for, um, for the special operations work that I did. I did eight deployments in Afghanistan as an AFO at, the, at JSOC. Like, so I had all this experience. So why would I feel inadequate to go back to Afghanistan and do that? Well, it's my history, right? If many of you know my story, I came home from my last deployment, and, and I struggled bad. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I dealt with debilitating panic attacks. My life went in a downward spiral. I ended to where I almost ended up taking my own life and becoming a veteran suicide statistic. And, and since the redemption of that, I have still continued to struggle with anxiety, with uh, depression at times, and ev even panic attacks. I mean... Even since I started Mighty Oaks, I found myself in the emergency room on two occasions because my blood pressure was 200 over 130. I'm a pretty healthy guy. My blood pressure is that high because of that level of panic and anxiety that I would feel. Uh, and there's other moments that I could tell you that I, I can't even get in a car by myself and drive to the gas station because the level of panic and anxiety I feel because I feel like if I'm alone, I, I could just die. Like I've, I've struggled with that. So now going to a place like Afghanistan again, like I don't know how my body's going to respond. The last time I was there, this happened to me. I lost friends there, and all these things happened to me. So I had no idea how my body was going to respond. So why would I feel inadequate? It's my past telling me, hey, you can't do this anymore. That's in the past. You can't do this anymore. But God was burdening my heart to do this. And for the last 10 years, I've been going in front of the, the active duty military, and I've, I've been privileged to speak to 250,000 active duty troops. And the message I talk to them about primarily is resiliency, the pillars of resiliency. You know, the, four, the four pillars of resiliency are mind, body, spirit, social, right? So I talked to them about when I went to Afghanistan those eight times, I had three of those pillars. I was mentally tough. I was physically in the best shape of my life. Socially, I was with the, the premier JSOC special operations team. I was with the best guys. But that spiritual pillar, I didn't have. And because of that, it almost cost me everything, right? It almost destroyed me. And so I tell them, if you could have that spiritual pillar, if you could have those four pillars, you're going to be able to do your job the best possible way you could do it. You're going to be resilient from the hardships. And if you do fall on your face, you're going to be able to bounce back. I've been preaching that for the last 10 years. And I believe it. But the truth is, I never really tested it myself. I felt like I've, I've rounded out those four pillars. I have a relationship with Christ. I have a good foundation now. But I never really got to test it at that level that I'm challenging these young men and women to do. And now I'm being called to go out and test it. And uh, I can tell you that my mind isn't where it used to be. My body certainly isn't. And, uh, I mean, right before I left for Afghanistan, I was, uh, you guys know I like to train jiu-jitsu. That's my, my hobby and a uh, very serious hobby. And, and uh, I was working, getting prepared to go to Afghanistan. And, my, and, uh, and I, didn't, I wasn't really hydrating because when I get working, I don't stop to drink and I don't sleep. I'm like, you know, not sleeping, not hydrated, not stretched out. And I just go in the gym and I start training. And three days before I leave, I snapped my groin muscle off the bone. It, it hurt <laughs> bad. <laughs> and, and the next morning, I got an MRI, and they told me I had to get emergency surgery, right? I had to get it sewn back on the bone. And I'm like, well, I can't. I'm going to Afghanistan. And, uh, and they said, well, you have to get emergency surgery. And I said, well, I had a few questions. One is it if I have, just in, by chance, I have to start running to or from something. Uh, <laughs> All right, is it going to hold up? And the doctor's like, well, you know, because I was worried. Like, am I going to fall down? Is my team going to have to worry about me? And they said, well, you have five muscles. One of them's attached. You have four other ones. So I'm like, he's like, it's really going to hurt, but it'll hold up. And the second was, am I going to damage it worse? And, uh, and he said, no, it's as damaged as it can be. It's detached. So, so <laughs> I didn't get the surgery, and, and, I, and I went to Afghanistan. You know, and so, you know, my mind and body wasn't quite where it was, but now I'm getting to test this spiritual pillar that I've been talking about. And the reason... The reason, uh, if you guys want to know how this all started for me, to go to Afghanistan was kind of selfish. It was my, my friend Aziz. If you guys have read some of my books, I talk about Bashir. Bashir's really Aziz. I hid his name before to protect him. But Aziz wasn't my interpreter. He was my teammate. 
uh, he and, he and the, t- the two of us usually worked by ourselves together. We go into the mountains of Afghanistan and the mountains of Pakistan, uh, the back alleys of, of uh, different Taliban villages to put our team on target to capture or kill bad guys. That's what we did. The two of us did. And, uh, and I mean, I can tell you there's never been a, uh, like a, a, a village I've been around where I have to walk around the corner in the middle of the night and he would let me go first. He always wanted to go first because he, would, he cared about me. He saved my life on three occasions, uh, probably more than that, uh, but tangibly saved my life on three occasions. He saved many other service members' lives. Uh, rescue operations, I've seen him save several uh, uh, Navy SEALs uh, on those rescue operations. One of the most American guys, and patriotic guys I've ever met, never been to America. Uh, he's just an amazing human being. And when we, when we were not operating, I didn't go back on a base and leave him. I went to his home. I played you know, soccer with his kids and and his nep- nieces and nephews ate dinner with his family. He's like, I love this guy. And I was not going to let him get left there. I had been trying for six years to get him through the special immigrant visa process, and it wasn't working. It's a very broken system. And so one of our teammates, Dan Stinson, and I started devising a plan of how we're going to go get Aziz, his wife, and his six kids. And while we were doing that, one of our team members, you've seen it in the video, the guy, one of the guys with the blurred face, he said, hey, I identified 3,500 kids, these orphan kids. If we're going to go get Aziz and his family, we have to get these kids too. And then kind of paused for a second and said, all right, this isn't about Aziz. We have the skills, right? We have the ability. We have the know-how to do this. We have a ton of experience in our group. Let's go help as many people as we can. Now, we knew the United States military was not going to give us the resources, so we had a relationship with the United Arab Emirates, one of our team members, very close relationship with the royal family. And so we went to them. We presented presented how we we were going to go about doing it, and they decided to support us. They gave us two C-17 planes, which are really big military planes, pilots, an airstrip. They gave us a place to set up our joint operations center in Abu Dhabi, and they gave us uh, the access to the humanitarian center. We didn't know how much time we would have. Uh, we knew the United States was holding the, the airport, and we worked with the DOD there to get onto the airport, but uh, we didn't know how much time we were going to have. We ended up having, you know, came out to 10 days. And in 10 days, we just helped rescue as many people as we could, Americans, our interpreters and their families, Women uh, who couldn't defend themselves, that would be, that would be uh, vulnerable. Children like orphans and Christians that we persecuted. That's who we were going after. In a period of 10 days, we, we ended up getting 12,000 people. And Aziz was the first ones that we got out. And when that kind of dust settled to that and uh, we lost the airport, we recognized that there were still people going to be left behind. Now, you heard on the news, like, you know, whether there was 100 Americans still there or, or thousands, I would say, from my experience, there were thousands still left there. Uh, but even if there's one, we had to go get them. And, uh, and there was not only the Americans, but these vulnerable groups there. And so because the airport was over, we decided we we're going to continue on. And since then, we've continued pulling people out of remote parts of Afghanistan by air support with lots of other organizations like Mercury One with Glenn Beck and, and uh, some other, other organizations that we've been able to work with that help, uh, have teamed up. And we've got another 3,000 people out. But we knew that the, the, the air support being able to fly people out would dry up. So we wanted to assess how to get people out across border on foot. Imagine if you were in Afghanistan, you lost your home, you lost everything, you're on the run and you're hiding, and you're in a, maybe a safe house or hiding in the, in the mountains, which the winter's coming, by the way, uh, in the brutal winters there, brutal, brutal winters there, and you're trying to figure out how to cross that border. This terrain is so treacherous, and then you have the danger of the Taliban, all these checkpoints, they don't know how to cross. I mean, they could spend weeks going through a valley with 25,000 foot peaks on each side, and then they get to the end of that valley to a border, and there's a couple hundred foot cliff, or a class five uh, rapid river, or a Chinese checkpoint with Chinese soldiers, or the Taliban. They don't know what they're going to run into, so they don't have a route out. And so we wanted to build some routes out for them to provide the information so they know how to get out. And so we decided to send a two-man team in. Uh, to go and gather information in a certain country, neighboring country, which I won't say. And the uh, two most experienced people to do that was uh, my, myself, because I had a lot of experience doing this from my previous time doing it, and, uh, and another uh, Fort Recon Marine scout sniper uh, named Dennis. He's an active duty staff sergeant, and uh, you know he's, he's me 15 years ago. He's younger, he's, uh, but he has a lot of the same skill sets. And so the, the two of us... We're going to go in, into this country and do that. Now, to give you an idea of where we're going, we're going out, we're landing in another country we've never been to before. We're going in the middle of the mountains where we know there's going to be multiple foreign militaries and intelligence agencies there. Uh, we're not going to be welcome, and we're going to be 
going across, swimming across a river in Afghanistan in the middle of the night, right, it's going to be very dangerous. And I, and, I, and I felt pretty excited about it, actually, to be honest with you. I was like, this is kind of cool. I'm getting to do this again. But as I, as I sat on that plane and I was flying over there, my mind started thinking, you gotta, this is a long flight. Right? My mind started thinking, am I still capable like, of doing this? Right? I, what's going to happen when I'm in the middle of these mountains and, and I have a panic attack? What if my blood pressure gets up to 200 over 130 and I have a stroke out there? How is, how is Dennis? Am I going to put his life in danger? Like, am I doing the right thing? Like, am I the right guy to do this? And I'm thankful for that fourth pillar now, that, that spiritual resiliency I have with that relationship with Christ, just to reject those fears and anxieties and say, you know what, God, you called me to do this, and you're going to equip me to do this. And I prayed on that plane. I prayed, you know, God, if you're calling me to do this, you put this burden on my heart. Clearly, you put this burden on my heart. You orchestrated all these things. Like, to actually get to go there is not easy. It takes a lot of logistical things to fall in place. You orchestrated these things. You're allowing them to happen. I need you to take away any fear, any anxiety, any physiological symptoms that might come on to me uh, and remove those things so I could do what you're calling me to do. So I could do this job, I could help these people and be there for my friend, be there for Dennis and, and the way he's going to need me to be there. And, and I prayed that and I, and, I, and I felt the peace about it. And then we got in that last leg, that last flight, and Dennis, he's a fellow believer and we prayed together. God, give us the courage. Give us the, the knowledge, the ability to do this, this work you're calling us to do. We prayed together, and then we went in and did that. And while we were there, thank you. <laughs> while we were there, we, uh, I mean, I can give you a little bit of an environment, and again, I don't want to say too much, but, you know, the, there was Chinese military everywhere uh, there. And I don't mean like rock kicking, like, I mean like, like high-level special operations guys. We've seen snipers. There were Russian military there. Obviously, there was a Taliban there. There was another military. Uh, I don't want to say the con- that, that country. There was another military there. And, uh, and uh, the Taliban was everywhere on the other side of the border. And there's all these mountains, giant, you know, 25,000 foot peaks. And the river between the countries is like, you know, Category 5, rapid ice melt river. And uh, so there's all these different factors that we were dealing with. And, uh, and I mean, crossing, to cross this river, in some parts crossing this river, there's one crossing that we did. Uh, they had like, about 100 yards this way was a, was a Taliban checkpoint with three Taliban on the roof with, with AK-47s. About 300 meters this, on this side, right, that we're going in between them, is a uh, Chinese uh, mech vehicle, a BMP, which is, has a PKM machine gun on the top and a spotlight to find people crossing the river at night, right? And this is the kind of environment we were in. And, and, and uh, we, we did 90 miles of border, uh, and, and we identified six crossings and provide all the information, and you look at all kind of different things, like how deep it is, what's the current to the water, how do you set up crossings, like all that, where do you find cover and concealment to hide people, and that's, so we're finding all the information, gathering all the information to provide that for them, and, uh, and meanwhile, you know, you got all these bad guys out there, and in uh, our phones, we had to turn off our electronics, because now they're trying to signal our phones and find us, and so we're out there, you know, really on our own, on our own. and one of the things I, I did was, uh, every day was praying, and one of the things I did, if you follow me on Instagram, I posted this post. I didn't tell you guys where I was or what I was doing, but I know a lot of you were following me. And, uh, and I, I just said Psalm 23, which is a prayer I recite every day. Uh, I, I've memorized it, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in the right path for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies, and he anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely his goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I pray that right before we went, went out and did that again, and I can tell you that all that time out there, God answered that prayer. We, 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 was, we were awake 23 hours a day. We slept for 10 days, sleeping like an hour a day, and I felt such a clarity, focus. I never felt tired. Uh, Dennis was the same. Uh, I never felt I humbly say I, I actually never felt scared. Uh, I felt the most peace that I ever felt in a situation like that, even in my other eight deployments with at the high-level team I was in. I felt such a, such a peace. And one time, one of, there was one moment we were crossing uh, this river, and we're swimming across, Dennis and I were swimming across this river, and we had a local Afghan with us swimming across this river. And, uh, and I, I was just like, why do I feel so comfortable right now? And, uh, and there was this motorcycle that passed by with two guys on it, and the Afghans, like, that's two Taliban scouts going by, like 30 yards b- by us. 
And I, I just felt so, so comfortable. But I was also asking, God, what the heck do you have me out here doing? <laughs> I'm 46 years old. I run a ministry. Like, I'm past this. Why am I out here? And honestly, while we're successful, I, I couldn't answer that question. Why God would have me out there? I didn't know. But four days later, I'm back home in the States, and I went straight to speak at an event for the Marine Corps because I didn't want to cancel on the Marine Corps recruits. Every, every quarter for the last six, seven years now, I get to go speak to these Marine Corps recruits and talk to them about those four pillars of resiliency. And while I didn't know why when I was in that river, once I stood in front of those recruits, I knew why. I was able to tell them about that fourth pillar from a tangible position from my personal experience now and say, hey, that when I was in Afghanistan this last time, the first time, those eight deployments, I had a strong mind, I had a strong body, I had a great team, but I didn't have that spiritual pillar. I lost everything. And this time, when I went back, right, I didn't have those things so well, right? My body is not quite what it used to be. My mind isn't quite as sharp as it used to be. Uh, I, it was, I love Dennis, but it was just me and him out there. We didn't have much of a team, <laughs> right? But the one thing I had, that one spiritual pillar, was the one thing that I needed to give me the peace to do that job. And, uh, and I felt good to be able to stand up there. And for the last 10 years, uh, for the first time, to be able to tell them something from a very tangible position from that real-world experience. And uh, I don't know if that's why God had me out there, but I feel like that was part of it. You know, we, we all have times like this in our life, right, where we believe God is leading us to do something, but because of our past, because of our insecurities or inexperiences, we feel unqualified or inadequate. It could be, right, it doesn't have to be Afghanistan. It could be anything. It could be parenting, right? You feel like, man, I, I'm just not being the parent that I could be. Maybe a relationship, whether it's with a sibling or a parent or, or, or a child or your, or your marriage. You feel like you just don't have quite what it takes. Or maybe God's calling you for service to your community or to this church or to a church or in a job you feel called to do a job but you just feel like you don't quite have what it takes. Look, lack, whether it's lack of obedience to God or just not taking action in life, that's typically based out of fear. You know, in the Bible, do not fear in some form or another is mentioned 365 times, one for every day of the year because we need it, right? Do not fear 365 times. That fear that we have, that fear that we put in ourselves is because we put our trust in the wrong places. Mainly, we put our trust in ourselves. And when we put our trust in ourselves, uh, we immediately will feel inadequate and insecure. Why? Because we know ourselves, right? We know how, how flawed and how flawed we are. We know our strengths, but we also know our weaknesses. We know what we can and cannot do. But God knows that even, even more than we know it ourselves, right? God knows our weaknesses. He knows our capabilities. He knows it more than we do ourselves. The Bible says in Luke, 20, uh, Luke 12, 7, that he actually knows the numbers of hairs on our head, which makes me feel really good because... He means he's constantly with me because the number of hairs on my head tend to change like every minute. <laughs> you know, he knows us. God knows us. He knows what we, where we're weak, but he calls us anyway because he knows we can't do it on our own. And that's why we must do three things. I really have three, three points for you that, in this. Uh, number one, we have to have faith in God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Right? If, we, if we look at things and look at big goals and we try to tackle them ourselves, as the worship leader was saying earlier today, the, the amount of weight that comes on us, the anxiety, the, the, the pressure that we put on ourselves by looking at it and saying, all right, I have this big thing in front of me, a lot of times we can't handle it. I, I think about something like Afghanistan. I'm like, if, that, if I would look at the circumstance of Afghanistan and say, hey, we're going to go rescue these 15,000 people, Dennis and I are going to go into the middle of the mountains of Afghanistan and swim across the river in the middle of the night, getting past, you know, Russians and Chinese and all these. Like, that seems overwhelmingly impossible. But when we lean on the faith of God and we're doing the things that he calls us to do, right, it, 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 it just, it feels right, it is right, it's what we're, where we're supposed to be. Number two, be obedient when he calls us, right? If God calls you to do something, say Yes. Be obedient. Don't think about if you're capable because he is. In 1 Thessalonians 5.24, it says, He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. If God's calling you to do it, he's going to see it through. He's going to find the victory. It may not look the way you want it to look, but it's God's victory, and it's going to happen the way he wants it to happen. Right? If he's calling you to do it, do it. 
he will see it through. Number three, don't compare. Galatians 6, 4 says this, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. We all do this. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt says this, comparison is the thief of joy. When we compare ourselves to others, it's a thief of joy. We're all, we're all guilty of it. Uh, when you look at something, you know, some of the things it's, that we do, it's not really the, the thing itself that matters, right? Afghanistan, Afghanistan's a big thing. Afghanistan's a big deal. It was a big success. But the size of the thing, it doesn't really matter. What actually matters is when, whatever God's calling you to do, be obedient to that. Um, I could tell you, I, I'd be much more scared of working the children's ministry than going back to Afghanistan. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I have a life of experience. I'm equipped to do Afghanistan. I'm, there's a lot of things I'm not good at. If you don't believe that, ask my wife Kathy. She'll give you the list. There's a lot of things I'm, I'm not good at. God doesn't care about, about worldly accolades or, or measures of success. We all get caught up in this. I'm probably the worst. I'm very competitive. Everything in my life to me is a competition. I want to do the very best I can. You know, even preparing for a message, right? I'm, I'm, I'm like studying and preparing for a message in ministry. I'm always like, you know, looking at stats and numbers. It's great to do that. It's, it's great to be driven. But the truth is, God doesn't care about those little accolades of success. What he cares about us is, is us being obedient to what he wants us to do. Us trusting him. And then in the victories, giving him glory for it. That's what matters. Now, as it turns out, the Bible is full of characters that are just like you and me. Uh, people... The, uh, the people of the Bible, the heroes of the faith, the men and women, uh, or men and women that faced moments where they were either scared to do what God was calling them to do, or they felt unqualified, just like we do. And, uh, but at some point, they made a decision to say yes and do what God was burdening them to do. And one of those people is a man named Gideon. Now, the Israelites, after the Israelites made it to the promised land, the, the, Midian, the Midianites uh, heavily oppressed them for about 10 years. They would pillage their homes. They would kill them. Uh, they would destroy their co- crops. They would even take their livestock from them. So some of the people began hiding, living in caves. And a, a lot of the Israelites uh, started, they stopped worshiping God because they felt like God had abandoned them. And in such times of, of, of oppression, right, God's always going to call warriors to stand up and fight for what, what he wanted to see done. And the thing is, it's not always the most, uh, the warrior that we would expect, right? We, King, King David didn't slay Goliath. The little boy gave it, David, slay Goliath. And when we went to Afghanistan, if you watch that video, there were some gray hairs in that video. Most of us were, most, all of us, I think, were in our 40s. A few, uh, one or two in their 50s, Dan, my buddy Dan's pushing 60, right? There were some, some older guys in that video, and they had one, probably one of the younger ones, uh, has a busted groin, right? So it was the very unexpected uh, group of people. Uh, that's what God usually uses. Right? And in this case, it was Gideon. Gideon was the weakest person in his family. The Bible says he's the weakest person in his family from the weakest tribe in Israel. And on top of that, he was scared. How do we know he was scared? When the Bible introduces him, he's hiding in a wine press, sifting wheat. When you sift wheat out, you, you kind of beat the wheat. They say, you know, when you hear separate the, the wheat from the chaff, getting the husk off. You usually do that outside when the breeze is blowing, so it blows that, the chaff away, and you're left with the wheat. He was hiding down in the wine press doing this. He was scared. In Judges uh, 6, 12 through 16, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Do not, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength, go in the strength you have, and save Israel from Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said again. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and I will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Right, so... uh. Gideon is literally arguing with God, saying, like, who, me? Like, you came to the wrong address. Like, you had it wrong. Like, I'm not your guy, right? I'm, I'm not qualified. I'm, I'm not strong enough. Yet God said, am I not sending you? Right? Am I not sending you? God was using the unexpected 
to do the unimaginable. And in my life, in your life, God will use us, the unexpected, to do the unimaginable. And Gideon decided to say yes. And he did it the best way he knows how. Get as many of your friends as you can, right? That's what he did. He went out and found as many people. I don't know how long it took him. The Bible doesn't say, but he mustered up 32,000 people to fight the Midianites. By the way, it's, it's not the Mennonites, the Midianites. The Mennonites are the good guys, right? They're, they're usually cool. They're usually pretty cool people, right? This is the Midianites. There was 135,000 fighters. So you have 35,000 to 135,000, right? A four to, four to one ratio. Not very formidable odds, but Gideon, uh, God told Gideon, hey, you gathered too many people. I think, what? Like, gather too many people? It's four to one. Why would he have gathered too many people? Because God didn't want anyone to mistake the victory for being Gideon's. God wanted the victory to be his, right? 32,000. 32,000, you could have thought, well, maybe Gideon was a pretty good strategist. Maybe the odds were in his favor. Not impossible for him to win four to one. And just like the 12 of us in Afghanistan, I think the military could have done it. Have been, they probably could have done it better than us. But I wouldn't be able to stand here today and tell you that there's no way for me to explain what happened other than God orchestrated it, one of the 12 of us. And that's what God wanted in this scenario. So God told Gideon to send home any fighters who were scared. And apparently a lot of them were scared because 22,000 of them went home. <laughs> there were 10,000 10, left. So now they're outnumbered 14 to 1. And what do you think God says? Still too many. You still have too many, Gideon. Send them home. I can imagine what Gideon's thinking. Gideon's thinking like, what in the world, God? I, I, you asked me to do this impossible mission. I already told you I'm the least qualified, and I raise up the best force I can, and you totally dismantle it. Right? So God told Gideon to go down to the river. He gave him a plan to select the final men. And what God said was, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as dogs and those who kneel down to drink. So 300 of them lapped water from cupped hands with their tongues. And the other 9,700 of them got down on their knees and stuck their face in the water to drink. And I'm a military strategist, and I'm thinking of this from a military standpoint, and I'm thinking the guys who cupped the water in their hands and lapped water, they could look around. They were still alert. But those who got down on their knees and stuck their face in the water, they weren't very alert fighters. And so God sent them away. And Gideon stuck with only 300 of them now. He's at 300 people. And, uh, and God instructs Gideon, he says, tonight's the night, you guys are going to go, and you're going to have victory over the Midianites. And, and, you know, God knows our fears. He knows our anxieties. He knows our hearts, including the fear that Gideon had that, hey, I only have 300 people, 135,000, right? I have faith, God, but I'm still scared. And so, God, so I mean, this is the you got to remember that the Midianites are people that had ruled him for a decade. His family is living in caves. caves. He's seen the oppression uh, he's seen the tangible what actually was really happening. He was hiding in a wine press right before all this started. The Bible says that the 135, it talks about the 135,000. It says that there were so many of them, they were as thick as locusts, and them and their camels couldn't be counted any more than you could count the sand on the seashore. That's how the Bible describes them, right? And so God tells Gideon, if you're still afraid, this is what I want you to do. You and your, you and your servant go into the Midian camp, sneak into the Midian camp, and listen to what they're saying. And so Gideon and his servant snuck into the camp, and they start listening to what two Midianite men were saying. And one of the men told the, others, told the other, I had a dream that God gave Gideon victory over us. And when Gideon heard this, he became inspired, he became motivated, it was exactly what he needed to hear. And he knelt down, and he began worshiping God, and he went to his 300 men, and he said this. He said, get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into our hands. Right, and the Bible says that Gideon and his men left to go attack the Midianites. They surrounded the camp in the, middle of, in the cover of darkness. And they had torches and trumpets. And when Gideon sounded the, sounded the trumpet call, they started yelling, for the Lord and for Gideon. And as that happened, the Midianites panicked. And in their panic, in the, in the darkness, they couldn't see who was coming after them. They just started killing everyone around them, which was themselves. And, and as they started killing themselves, the, Gideon and his men went in and mopped up their remainder, killed everyone else, including the two kings who Gideon killed himself. Like Gideon's obedience to God gave Israel a major victory in the history of, of Israel. Right? It, it broke them away from freedom and brought them back to having the promised land that God had given them. And, uh, and you know, you think about how Gideon, against all these odds, right, trusted God for this impossible mission, even knowing that he wasn't qualified. You even see his confidence, actually, if you, as you read this text, you see his confidence grow 
as God's cutting his army by 99% from 32,000 to 300. Just like the 12 that we had, right? God is able to show that true victory comes from his hands and not ours. Right? And uh, Gideon, you know, again, Gideon was not qualified. He was the least qualified. Last month in Afghanistan, in my own self-doubt, I thought, God, there has to be a better choice than me. And you probably thought that same thing about yourself at times. But Gideon had one thing in his control. He had a choice. I had a choice. And you, you have a choice. We could simply choose, as Gideon did, to say yes to God and disregard our fears and inadequacies and simply be obedient to the things that God's burdening our hearts to do. We're not going to know how it's going to turn out, right? We don't get that. We don't get the results in advance. I didn't know how it was going to turn out in Afghanistan. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, I didn't know if I was just going to get Aziz, if we would even get Aziz, if we'd get no one, if we'd be rejected, we ran away, if we'd roll in there and get kidnapped. I, I, didn't, I didn't know like what the results was going to be. And thankful we were successful. Thankful we, we were able to help a lot of people. And I, I'm home safe. I'm, he, I'm here today and my, all my friends and we're all home safe. So I'm thankful for that. But we didn't know what the results was going to be. The story of Gideon is a victorious story for Israel. But Gideon didn't know what the results was going to be. The truth is many followers of Christ have faced extreme hardships and even died doing exactly what God called them to do. That's the truth. And uh, I mean, just look at the apostles. Most of them died. But that's not the point, right? The point isn't our personal victory. The point is obedience. And in the big picture, that obedience leads to the ultimate victory that God has for his plans. Right? Can you imagine, like, if we all lived our lives with that perspective, if we trusted God and let God work in our, in our lives in every area? I mean, I, I, even myself, as I'm preparing this message, I'm like, wow, if I, if I, I wish I had the faith like I did in this mission of Afghanistan, in every area of my life, I could put this level of faith in my life. What would my life, I'm thinking to myself, what would my life be like if I had this in every area of my life? It's, it's really challenging me to set that goal to do that for myself. Um, this isn't ab about some operation in Afghanistan. This isn't about like you accomplishing your goals in life and finding your purpose in life. It's not even in, in ministry, like a ministry like Mighty Oaks. It's not about our goals and stuff. Like, what, it's about is, what it's about is saying yes to God and letting him use us, work through us to change the world and put a spotlight on him so that everyone sees it. If we, if we could get that, what would our homes look like? What would, what would our relationships look like? What would our communities look like, this church? For God's sakes, what, what would this country look like if we got that? The truth, is, the truth is we can. We can do that. If we simply disregard our fears, reject our past and inadequacies, and lean forward to the things that God burdens our heart for. You know, the Apostle Paul got this. In uh, Philippians thir uh, 3, verse 13, 14, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Right? What he's saying here is, I don't have it all figured out, but what I do know is this. I will not let my past hold me back from the work that God's calling me to do. Right? What's holding you back? What's holding us back? Let it go and say yes. Yes to the things of God so that he could do things through you that only God can do. Can we pray? Lord, I'm so thankful uh, that you don't just... That you, first of all, that you didn't just create us, Lord. You created us for a purpose, to be part of your plan and purpose, Lord. And when we step into a relationship with you, Lord, when you call us and burn our hearts to things, you don't just blindly do that, Lord. You, you give us the ability to see it through. Lord, all we have to do is accept you and, uh, and, and be obedient to your call, Lord, and you'll equip us. You'll give us the courage. you give us the ability to accomplish those things. And I'm thankful that you let us be part of your plan and that's how you orchestrated it all. I'm thankful for this time in Afghanistan that we've been able to be part of this, that you allowed us, you trusted us to be part of that, Lord. Uh, I'm thankful for the people that we've got to rescue. I continue to pray for those people that are still there. So many people are still there hurting, Lord. And I pray that you'll continue to equip us to go for them and, uh, and get them safe. Lord, I thank you for this church and the support that we've got uh, from them. And I thank you for Pastor Jeff's leadership, Lord. And I pray for each person here, Lord, as they feel burdened by God to do something important in their lives, Lord, you'll give them the courage to say yes to you, reject their past, reject their insecurities, say yes to you, and step forward into what you have for them, Lord. I pray that in Jesus' name.